Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for showing your love to us in Jesus Christ. We no longer need to question your love for us because you have shown us in him your great love for us. I pray for every soul here today, every soul listening to my voice, that we would give our lives fully to you. It's the only right response. I pray for those who need to receive your grace today for the first time, that it would happen today. I pray that we would be activated to live on mission, that today would mark a new beginning for us. So we listen to your spirit as you speak. Move among us. Touch my heart. Change my life. In Jesus' name, amen. So for every effect, there's a cause. Every kid here knows this. If I clap my hands, there's a sound. The effect is the sound. The cause is, kids, my hands. In fact, let's, let's do it together. Everybody clap once. Clap twice. All right. Let's do this. Let's say thank you again. Uh, just applaud our orchestra, our choir, all who've led us in worship. Let's praise God for them. Together, collectively, we praise the Lord. You've proven the law of cause and effect. It's Aristotelian law of, of, of cause and effect. It's causation, right? For every effect, there has to be a cause. Every kid knows this. Every person knows, and yet some reject it. We become so smart, so open-minded, I suppose, our brains have fallen out. People, uh, people argue over how we even got here on the planet. Ultimately, there's a reduction. Ultimately, you go to an uncaused cause. It's what Thomas Aquinas called the unmoved mover, the first cause. The Bible begins, Genesis 1-1. It, do you know it? In the beginning, God. You see, God is assumed in the Bible. There's not a formulaic apologetic for the existence of God. There aren't 10 points as to how you can prove that God exists. He's assumed the only definitive word about atheism in the Bible is Psalm 14.1. The fool is said in his heart, there is no God. As if to say, of course there's a God and you must take him into account. And today what I want us to see as we focus in, as we behold the risen King, when we look at him by faith, he transforms our deepest fears into a life of peace and purpose. We just sang about it. We don't fear death. We don't fear life because our King is risen. And it changes everything. Think about this. For every cause, there is an effect. For every effect, there's a cause. The church didn't start because a book was written. Christianity is not founded on the most read book, the best-selling book of all time. The Christian faith is not, didn't start because a book was written. As amazing as it is, the Word of God. Christianity didn't start because the church was born. Christian, the Christian faith didn't start because theological you know, theories or ideas or doctrines selected themselves systematically into a theology that formed a religion. Christianity didn't start because of a religious structure or doctrine. Christianity didn't start because of a new moral high moral way to live the highest ever because of a new way of life as fascinating and amazing as that is Christianity started 
because of an event, an historic event. The cause was the resurrection. The person is Christ himself. Historic person, historic event started all of it. And the effect comes here today into every heart and soul. Because a resurrection demands a response. And so today I want to talk about the response to the resurrection. You see, many of you like me, if the resurrection did not take place, I have no reason to live. Not because I'm I'm a pastor. I have no purpose in life. If there is no resurrection, there's no forgiveness. There is no hope. There's no life eternal. This life is meaningless. And no wonder many people have come to that conclusion apart from Christ. Because it's true. There's no hope. There's no reason to live. But if... The resurrection is true. We need to flip our focus. Here's the challenge. Many of us focus on our fears. We focus on our failures. But we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. The resurrected king. Because the resurrection changes everything. And it demands a response. I heard Billy Graham say years ago, Jesus had two verbs in his vocabulary. You know what they are? Come and go come and go he says come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest we focused on this last week such a glorious Palm Sunday he says come to me don't miss that not to your favorite author your favorite pastor your favorite podcast your favorite what Come to me. And this is the problem for many of us. We fix our focus on our problems. And the great modern deterrent in our day is that we do not stop and focus on him. You need to gaze at him. Glance at your problems. Gaze at him. Glance at your problems. Too many of us gazing on our problems. Glance at Jesus. And the solution is found in the text, the Easter text today, Matthew 28, 1 through 10, that Megan read earlier. Turn to Matthew 1 through 10. We're going to follow along. I want you to see two responses to the resurrection. All right, two responses, four words, two phrases, if you will, two couplets, four commands. The words I want you to see here in Greek are all imperative commands. Do this, he says. Here's the response to the resurrection. Because a resurrection requires a response. The cause is the resurrection. The effect comes to every one of us today. So in Matthew 28, verse 1, the women are going to the empty tomb to care for Jesus' corpse. To care for his body. So they thought. And then in verse 5, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. You may know that's the number one command in all of scripture. Our propensity towards fears. Don't be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Look at this. The first response. The first effect of the the resurrection is an invitation. Come and see. Imperative commands, come and see, look, he says, behold, stop, look and listen. The great, again, deterrent for many of us is our inability, no, our unwillingness to stop. We've got all kinds of information Things coming into our eyes, into our ears, in front of our screens. We're hearing the news and we do not stop and discipline our minds and our hearts to focus on him. It's why every gathering on Sunday morning is so critical in your life and mine. It's why every day to focus on him, to be in his word. Every single day. Because we're prone to gaze at our problems then. Glance at Jesus. 
This is why you experience so much worry in your life. It's why you have so much anxiety in your life. It's why you're led to, to, to dis-ease and struggle in your mind because you will not come to him for rest. It's why the church is so important. It's why we encourage each other. It, frankly, it's why you need to be back next week. Every Sunday is Easter Sunday. Every day is resurrection day for the believer. It's our inability, our unwillingness to stop. So I'm challenging you to behold him. In this passage, this passage alone, four times we see the word edu in the Greek. It means behold. Look. Edu. Stop. Look. Behold him. The great Easter invitation is to come and see. Come see the empty tomb. Just look at him. By faith, yes, through his word, which is true, look at him. The tomb is empty. Years ago, I went to the garden tomb. Have you ever been to Jerusalem? Some of you. Have you ever been to the garden tomb? Some of you have. We're going to go again in the fall. If you want to come join us. I can't wait to be there again. Come and join us. Reach out to us. We still have room. Come and see I remember going to the empty tomb. I've shared this story with some of you. I, I was standing in the line, the tourists, you know, group, my group is there. We're, we're going in. You can get a few people in, look around in the garden tomb. It's amazing. And I was waiting, on, I was just standing there, waiting to go in. I'm like, man, I can't wait to see this. A guy comes out of the, out of the tomb and he, he says to our group, hey, he, he's not here. There's nothing in there. He's risen. Like nothing in there to see. And we all kind of laughed. Stop me in my tracks. Because I knew that just like that first Easter morning, that was the response. He's not here. <laughs> He's not here. Come and see. Consider the power of this invitation. It's to you. It's to you. He says, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace between you and God. Peace within your own mind. Peace with you and others. But here's the problem for many of us. We don't think we're worthy of that invitation. I mean, we can parse it out, but what it comes down to, we don't feel like we're worthy. We don't feel like we're loved. Somewhere along the way, someone told you, maybe from the time you were a child, you're not worthy. You're not, you're not loved. You're not lovable. You're not smart enough. You don't, you don't look good enough. You, you don't have the right degree. You don't have the right job. You're not in the right family. You're not in the right place. And many of us have come to believe that we're not lovable. And it's ruining us. Scientists tell us we have neural pathways in our brains. Like well-worn paths, we run down these same lines and so we wear them out. We, like default mode, we go to these thoughts. I'm not, I'm not loved. I, I, I don't, I've been told I'm not worthy. I, I don't think I'm worthy. I don't even think I'm worthy. I'm not worthy of this kind of love. It's about to kill us. It leads to a life of hopelessness. But there's another way. You can change that story. Do what the women did. You can run to Jesus. And friends, the Christian life is a constant running to him. Remind me again of how much you love me. Come and see. Come and see. And this morning, right now, he's inviting you into the story that he invited these women into, the story we find ourselves in. It's the story of redemption. And he's calling us into it right now. I'm proclaiming to you what is at the center of our faith. It's what Paul preached and proclaimed as a, as a doctrine of faith. A statement of faith to the church in Corinth in chapter 15. For I deliver to you as of first importance the main thing what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, 
He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, just as the prophets foretold. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive. This wasn't long after the resurrection, as if to say, go talk to him. And, and yet some have fallen asleep, but then he appeared to James, then to the apostles, all the apostles. This was a doctrinal statement in the early church. It's the center of it all. And if you're a guest, our members know this, this is our proclamation. Christ lived the perfect life on our behalf. Died on the cross for our sin. He was buried and he rose again. The first fruits of resurrection. So that we who believe would follow him in eternal life and life abundant in the here and now. Come and see. We say it this way. The Christian faith is not work harder, get better. It's believe more deeply what Christ has already accomplished for you. It's not what you do for him. It's what he has done for you. I like to say, stop trying to be like him. Just behold him. Just look at how much he loves you. Look at him dying on the cross for you. Look at him taking on your punishment. Look at the empty grave. Come and see before Jesus is our good example. He's our great substitute. On the cross for us. Risen again. The more we behold him. Listen, this is the Christian life. The more we behold him, the more we become like him. It's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another as we become like him. And then he says, this is the work of the Holy Spirit in us. That's the Christian life. It's that simple. Disciplined, yes. Yes. To come to him to say, I will behold you every day and every moment of the day, I behold your glory. I want to see you. He is saying to you today, friend, come and see. But watch this. There's another challenge. Then go quickly and tell. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And here's that word again. Behold. Look, look, look. He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, and that's the word he do. Behold, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. How about that? Fear and joy mixed together. It can happen. And ran to the disciples to tell his disciples. And behold, look, stop. Look, listen. Jesus met them there. He said, greetings. They came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. There it is again. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. The cause is the resurrection. The effect is not only an invitation to come and see. It's an activation. It's a proclamation. Friends, listen to this. Come and see Go and tell. Come and see. Go and tell. Twice we see this command here. The women go immediately. They go and tell. They worship Jesus. They see him on the way. And they tell the others. And don't miss this. They immediately run. And it says they fell at his feet and worshiped him. Friends, on on, on this day, but every day, we should wake up. We should fall on our knees and worship him every day. We should rush to worship him with brothers and sisters next Sunday. We should be here early, ready to worship him. It's time. It's time to give your life fully to him. And don't miss this. It's women who proclaim the gospel. Women are the first evangelists. Mary is the first proclaimer of truth. She is the first sent one. This would have been stunning in this culture. 
where women couldn't even stand in the court of law to bring testimony. He said, well, why did it happen? I mean, why is it told like that? Because that's what happened. Everybody says, you know, the disciples, they ran. When Jesus was arrested, all of them ran, fled, and left him. Not the women. I say that because Jesus is calling all of us. Women. Men. Boys. Girls. Teenagers. College students. Come and see. Go and tell the world. Go and tell somebody. Who do you know that needs to know? Who have you told this stunning news that has changed your life? If it has, do you believe? He's calling every one of us. And here's what happens. One person goes with this twofold command. Come and see. Go now. Go and tell. They tell the disciples. They tell another and another. And the word has come to us. And I proclaim it to you today. It came to me. It's changed my life. And it demands a response. The Bible says that God loves you, friends. This is the truth about who you are. You are loved. He has a wonderful plan for your life. It's a plan of peace. A plan of purpose. He's calling you to come to him today. But sin is standing in the way. On the other side of the coin, sin is the great cause The effect is your rejection of God, your rebellion, and your broken life, our broken world. Sin is the cause. The effect is our rejection of his peace. Peace in relationships, judging others, not being kind and loving, striving between family members, relationships, even nations, war against one another. In a single verse, it says, for the wages of sin is death. The cause is our fallenness, our sin. The effects, death and hell apart from God for eternity. For those who do not turn to him. But the free gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Friends, listen, sin is a condition of the heart. It's why you need an outside source to set you free. You can't rescue yourself. God sends Jesus to rescue you from your sin. And it's by faith. This is where you struggle today. Faith, praise God, it's by faith. Not your works. This is what separates Christianity from all other religions in the world. It's not us trying to get to God. It's God coming to us in Jesus. Only Christ can rescue you from your sin. Only Christ has lived a perfect life. Only Jesus has died on the cross. And when you turn to him, it destroys all of your fears. It destroys all of the failures of your past. And you focus, you fix your eyes on him. He's calling us today not to gaze at our problems and to glance at Jesus, but to gaze at Jesus. Behold him. Glance at your problems. This is my Easter challenge. Flip your focus. Flip your focus. Behold him. Gaze at Jesus. Glance at your problems. This is the way to live. Are you doing it? We want to help you. That's why the church exists. We want to help you hear from God. We want to teach you how to walk with him every single day. You may say, well, how do I do this? By faith, receive his grace today. How do I hear from him? I've said it recently. People wonder, how can, uh, my life is so, uh, there's so much noise. How do I hear from God? There's a book for that. I'll, I'll say it again. Friends, if you're a Christian, a lot of, most of us are Christians here. You're going to have to open your Bible. At some point, as a follower of Jesus, you've got to open your Bible. And I'm not talking about, well, I hope the pastor's opened it up and he's really telling us what's true. You open the word. Let us teach you how to do this. It's why our connect groups are so important. It's why being a member of a local church is so important. It's why it's critical that you come back, yes, next week, because this is the text for this course. This is what we preach and teach. 
Not the ideas of this world, but the truth of God's word. This is what we're about. We want you to learn his word. Next year, we do this all the time, but year 2023, we're already planning it's going to be a year, year in the word. We're going to study it. We're going to get underneath it. We're going to know it. But that's our goal every single time we gather. And every day you wake up, get in his word, hear the truth. Don't miss this. The resurrection activates a mission in your life. And here's the challenge I want to leave you with. He says, come and see. But then he said, now go and tell. And this is the reason that our church exists. That's why we're here. In Matthew 28, at the end of the book, the gospel that Matthew's written, we're going to be back in it next week as well. Come and join us. Jesus came and said to them, Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Only a resurrected king has all authority. All authority. Go, he says. Go and tell. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Have you been baptized? Have you received Christ? And have you been baptized? We want to talk with you about that today. Proclaim it. Let it be this day that you decide that you're going to follow him in baptism, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded. Are you teaching others? If you know the truth, you, you should be committed to teaching others. Here in the church, in your life, who are you discipling? Who are you telling? Go and tell the world. And here it is again, one last behold. Look at this, look, 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 look. Stop, stop. Listen, look. I am with you always. I'll never leave you nor forsake you to the end of the age. Come and see. Go and tell. I'm with you. On this, the morning of mornings. Friends, the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart right now. We see the ultimate cause and effect. The great cause, the resurrection, the effect. We come and see him constantly. We go and we tell others. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Which are you? He says, go and tell. And like Philip told his brother, Nathaniel, he invited him. He said, come and see. We found him. We found the Messiah. Have you found him? Friends, he's come for you. This news travels to you today and I proclaim it to you today. It is time. It's time. We've been through a lot over the past couple of years. We've lost so much. We grieve so much. It's time today to give your life fully to him because only Jesus can turn the great resignation into the great resolution. To resolve today, to give your heart fully to him. Praise him for second chances. Praise him that you're still standing. Praise him that you're still in the game and that he's speaking to your heart today to say, come to me. Come and see what I'll do in your life. Commit your life to him. Jesus is the one bringing this invitation. Not not your pastor. It's Christ himself. He says, come. Come and see. Go and tell. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your spirit is speaking to us even now. I pray for those who are here. Every soul that is hearing my voice. Friend, do you know him? By faith, give your life to him right now. You may have questions about that. You may wonder right now, by faith, Lord, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Say it to him privately, right where you are. Lord, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for living my own life and the mess that I have made. 
I give you my life. Make me the person that you have created me to be. Thank you that you are the God of the second chance. I turn to you. Others of us, you know that you know that you know that you have received him. Have you been baptized? Are you a member of of this church or a local church? Decide today. Do it today. Find a group of people. Find a connect group here. Find a group where you can grow to become like him, where you can know his word. Get involved. It's time. Lord, we love you. We we don't have enough words. So may our lives display as we tell the world that you are king. You are Lord of all. We give you our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.